Hello and welcome to the Gnostic Warrior radio show and podcast broadcasting from GnosticWarrior.com in San Diego, California to around the world. I'm your host, Mo, and today on the show we have Joe Atwell. He's a scholar, author, and producer of Caesar's Messiah. It's a great movie that I've personally watched and I give it a five stars. There's not many movies out there that you could watch that's loaded with so much information that definitely relates to not only the ancient Roman Empire and the beginnings of Christianity, but I also believe the modern world that we're living in today. I'm a fan of his work, and it's really a pleasure to have him on the show today. Thanks for being on the show today, Joe. How you doing? Good. Thank you for having me. Great. And, you know, I want to let the audience know that I'm a big fan of Joe's work. I've been watching his interviews over the last couple of years, and I, I did watch his movie called Caesar's Messiah, and I actually liked it a lot out of five stars. I give it a five, and I, I was really impressed with the information and the scholarly work that you've done over the years. But before we get into the great work you've done in the movie with Caesar's Messiah, can you tell us a little bit about your background before becoming a scholar and an author and, and a movie producer now? Yeah, I mean, uh, basically I have no background whatsoever in uh, this particular field. What really sort of brought me into it in hindsight was the fact that I grew up in uh, Japan and attended a kind of strange school, a Jesuit military academy, because this was the only... Um, uh, school that that uh, you know was was uh, accessible to me that spoke English for example nearby and so I went there for years and uh, the pedagogy was uh, strange it was really very focused on um, the Gospels and Christianity these were Jesuits who were pretty fundamental in their their beliefs and how they approach Christianity and. So um, I, I would study it every day, basically. It was just part of the, my world. And when I became older, I drifted away from the faith. It just you know, wasn't in my world. I didn't have some sort of big uh, negative reaction to Christianity. I just wasn't connected to it and just sort of stopped. You know, uh, At a very young age, I really was just not interested in it. And, but I always retained the curiosity about the Jesus character because I'd had so much uh, study, you know, of the Gospels and uh, uh, of just Christianity in general. And then later on, um, I noticed the controversy that had emerged about the, about the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, that um, people were confused as to why after 35 years they wouldn't release some of them. And uh, there were uh, quite a few paranoid rumors about why the, uh, they weren't releasing the, this material. And so I, I was curious about that and looked into the scrolls, just started reading about them as a general hobby. And um, what I found, it sort of amazed me because it clearly described, the, the scrolls described, a messianic cult in Judea at approximately the same time that uh, the Christian cult purportedly was wandering around, and yet this group was militaristic, uh, wanted to drive the Romans out of Judea. Um, their Christ would have been a warrior uh, like David, uh, sort of the original anointed king of the Jews. And so that really confused me. I was confused why this group isn't mentioned in the Gospels. And I was also confused as to um, how... Christians could have come into existence, the Christians that we're familiar with, at a time when Judea was a war zone. The um, uh, looking into the Gospels sort of required me to look at the history of the first century, and that's when I uh, really started to have uh, doubts about the um, historical nature of, of Jesus Christ. And what I saw was a, a an area that was occupied by Rome that contained a messianic movement that was militaristic and fought against Rome. In fact, was completely successful at certain points and drove the Roman legions out. So therefore it was obviously the national messianic movement, um, but would never have permitted a kind of Christian messianic movement. They would have seen uh, the character of Jesus Christ as blasphemous. So, 
I I was just um, curious about all this, and if you want to take your understanding to a, a more informed place uh, of the Gospels, to a more informed place, you've really got to study this guy named Flavius Josephus, because he was the only person that actually wrote a history of this era of Judea. So there's no other on-the-ground individual who's writing um, the history of the first century of Judea other than this guy Flavius Josephus. And so I started studying um, his history, and it was then that I noticed that there were a number of very strange parallels between events described in the Gospels and events described in the military campaign uh, that this particular Roman Caesar named Titus Flavius had. And so um, at, at a certain point, I just started studying that relationship. I was curious about what these parallels in Josephus really meant. And um, one day, I, you know, after having kind of looked at quite a number of them, I noticed an odd thing. I noticed that they were all occurring in the same sequence both in the Gospels and uh, in the uh, history of the war. And so that led me to realize that the whole ministry of Jesus had been uh, invented. Um, it was based on the military campaign, the, the ministry of Jesus, you know, his wandering around Galilee and his going into Jerusalem and then eventually his crucifixion. All of these were actually um, uh, stories that had been developed from prior stories. Uh, and so it became pretty obvious that uh, the character of Jesus Christ was a fictional one and that he had been invented for political purposes. In other words, uh, the Romans wanted to have a, an alternative Messianic movement um, that could exist in the empire. And so they came up with this uh, pacifistic turn the other cheek, give to Caesar what is Caesar's um, Messiah. And and just uh, attempted to develop a religion around him, and eventually they were successful. What role would Josephus play in, in forming uh, this role in Christianity in Rome? He was He's basically labeled as the Jewish historian. Where was he from? Well, I think actually uh, uh, he was a fictional character like Jesus, but um, the history that um, he gives is, is really um, extremely unusual. He claims to have been born into the royal family of, uh, of the Jews, the, the Maccabees. Um, he claims to have, as a young man, been a member at different times of all three major sects uh, that he describes of the Jews. So he was had the vast theological uh, background. He claims to have been a child prodigy, that he was dazzling people with his intellectual capacities when he was uh, 12 years old. Um, and then when the rebellion against Rome broke out in 66, he claims that they made him a general of the forces in Galilee. Um, now, according to Josephus, he was captured by the Romans. Uh, he had a divine inspiration at that point. The uh, God had a communication with him and told him that the old covenant between God and the Jews was broken, and a new covenant between God and the Romans was going to take its place. So um, he then uh, went to um, the uh, head Flavian generals, a guy named Vespasian, and he said, you know, um, I had this communication with God, and uh, he, he also explained that Vespasian would become the Caesar. At that time, Vespasian was just a general and so when this came about, when Vespasian, by some miracle, actually became Caesar, they then uh, claimed to have looked upon Josephus as a prophet, someone who had a, this connection to God, and they adopted him. So now this character, uh, Flavius Josephus, who starts out as a fundamentally religious Jewish person in Judea, ends up living in the Roman imperial court, um, as an adopted member of the imperial family, they give him, you know, a big apartment in their palace, and they give him funding, and he writes the history of the war. So that's uh, the the story of Josephus, which I think is just cockamamie, but um, it's what we've been given. The um, uh, the fact is, is that 
from the very beginning, from the absolute beginning, um, people have always known that there was a connection between Josephus's history and uh, the Gospels. In fact, you know, people like St. Augustine and Eusebius, I don't know if you know who they are, but they were, you know, the very first Christian theologians, and they all said the same thing. They said that the prophecies of Jesus, we know were true prophecies because the historian Josephus recorded that the very events that Jesus predicted came to pass uh, in the history that Josephus recorded. So from the very beginning, Josephus was uh, wired into the Gospels. In fact, in many of the very oldest versions of the Gospels we have, Josephus's work are actually attached to them like kind of a fifth book, like Matthew, Mark, Luke, and Josephus. And this was because they they were the fulfillment. They recorded the fulfillment of Jesus' prophecies. So, you know, so, so from the very beginning, you've got this uh, connection of the Gospels directly into this Flavian family's imperial court. And um, this is just very, very suspicious because this family, the Flavians, who became Caesars and, uh, uh, and in my opinion, produced the Gospels, all of the, the prophecies that Jesus makes, or, or most of the prophecies that Jesus makes, are about their military victories. Jesus says uh, Galilee will be crushed. He names these particular cities that are going to be ruined. He says that Jerusalem is going to be encircled with a wall. I mean, he predicts this. He predicts the temple is going to be raised, not one stone atop another. He predicts that this terrible thing that Daniel um, foresaw called the abomination of desolation is going to come about. Well, all of these things are military victories. They did all come to pass, and they were all military victories of the Flavian Caesars. So the victors write history. This is understood by everyone at this point. And in the case of the Gospels, at, to the extent they're history, they're simply a prophecy of military victories, not a history, but uh, they they are known to have been written after the war because there are events, everyone agrees, in the war that, that are recorded within them as predictions. And so, frankly, um, I'm always amazed that people look at uh, my understanding of the Gospels, my interpretation, with shock, because, frankly, it's just the very most routine way to interpret the Gospels, that they're a... Um, uh, you know, um, um, a recording of military victories done by the victors. Yeah, so in a in a sense, this would be the version of the Roman Empire, and the previous, the Old Testament, would be of the Israel of um, the East. So this was the new version, basically taken over by Rome yeah, and they they, incorporated exactly. it they into their government. They wanted to have um, a version of Judaism that was. Um, uh, compatible with uh, the um, Roman Empire. And this wasn't some sort of brand new technique that only happened, you know, this one time with Christianity. This was the routine stuff that the Caesars did. In fact, when uh, the character of Vespasian, or the, the soon-to-be emperor, he's a true historical individual, when Vespasian um, learned that he'd become Caesar, he was in Alexandria, Egypt, and so he went into the temple of Seraphis to pray, supposedly, and while he was there, Seraphis had a divine communication with him. Seraphis was a local, powerful, uh, you know, Egyptian god in, at the time. And Vespasian comes out of the temple and he goes, you know, I am Seraphis. I'm the new Seraphis. Seraphis has entered into me and I've become Seraphis. I'm the new Seraphis. And then he works a couple miracles. He cures the a withered arm and he makes a blind man see. So, you know, it was just a, a routine political operation for the Caesars to take on the identity of local gods. Um, and it was a, it was an old technique before the Roman Empire. I mean, the, uh, when the Potalemes took over Egypt, they became the uh, Ra, they became the Pharaoh. And you've got, you know, all this, uh, these old, their sarcophagus is, you know, of a, of a Greek pharaoh with a Greek style beard, you know, and this is just the normal um, way that rulers would operate uh, against their colonies because they, you know, when, when you colonize uh, another people, 
Um, it's a handy thing to try to absorb the religion because the religion is a point of control. The religion is a point that they can use to um, uh, have some sway with the population. And so when Vespasian became Caesar, he becomes the new Seraphis. But now when they conquered Judea a few years later, the idea that they would adopt the identity of the Christ um, is would just be routine. And this, of course, goes to the the major character in the Gospels. I mean, a lot of people think that the most important character in the Gospels is Jesus Christ, but he's really not. The most important character is the individual that Jesus predicts. Jesus says the Son of Man is going to come, and he's the one who has all of the, the maj majesty and the power, and he's going to do all these terrible things. All of Jesus' apocalyptic visions, you know, the Galilean towns getting crushed, Jerusalem encircled, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, these are things that he says are going to happen when the Son of Man comes to Judea, when the visitation is made by this badass guy. Um, so the question is, is really, well, who is the Son of Man? Right? Who is this individual Jesus is predicting? It's, a, it's literally a puzzle in the Gospels. And the way you can answer it is by looking at the time that Jesus indicates the individual will come within, which is 40 years. He he says that the guy's going to come before the generation listening to my words passes away, and the generation uh, is 40 years to the Jews of the era. Um, and uh, he lists the events that will occur, and these are all the events of the war. And so the war is exactly 40 years from Jesus' ministry. In fact, in almost an absurdity, um, the, uh, the date of Jesus' crucifixion is uh, Passover 33, uh, and the war concludes at 73 on Passover. So exactly 40 years to the day um, from the conclusion of Jesus' ministry, you have the end of the war. So this is obviously something that's created in hindsight um, and uh, um, is was done to uh, just give a little, uh, you know, mystical... Uh, veneer to this uh, this re Jewish religion that they the fake Jewish religion the Romans were developing, and so it, but it shows completely the identity of the Son of Man. I mean, the Son of Man that Jesus is predicting is simply obviously uh, the Roman Caesar who comes and does the stuff that Jesus predicts. And in the case of the uh, in the case of the, the Son of Man in the Gospels, it's just ridiculous because. Titus Flavius claimed to be the Jewish Christ. Uh, his court historians, every one of them, uh, Tacitus, Suentoni, Dio, every one of his historians said that the Jewish prophecies that supposedly saw this Messianic world ruler uh, actually foresaw the Flavian Caesar, right? So, so this simply, you know, it just literally can't be any clear in my mind, the Son of Man that Jesus is envisioning can only be one individual. There's only one person that can possibly claim to have these historical attributes, the attributes that Jesus envisions. And that individual claimed to be the Jewish Christ, and that individual would have been had a political motivation for developing Christianity. They were sick of wasting money on these rebellions. So it's really very... Uh, you know, my even though uh, my theory uh, receives a lot of uh, shock when people come across it, I've always, frank, frankly, seen this as strange because it's really the, um, the the most obvious way to understand the Gospels. It's the simplest, easiest way to read the text. It's that it produces a very clear translation. It, it the translation fits right into history and all of the events that uh, we know about the era. And frankly, there's nobody else that could have been uh, but this individual as far as, you know, who was the son of man Jesus predicted? Well, he was the Roman Caesar. End of story. Yeah, and that's what I think people out there that might not understand the history that coincides yeah. with the Bible, that, you know, the Romans were the, the inventors of the, the Christian religion, and at, at one time there was only one religion, and that was, you know, Roman Catholicism, and then everybody else was literally a Jew, if you weren't um, part of that religion. Right. And also, yeah, I mean, what happens is, it, is Rome makes it the state religion, uh, and so that's just, you know, that's that's what it what it was, and when it became the state religion, though, it was, you know, it was uh, 
uh, it was an operation. Rome Rome made it for as the state religion for a political purpose, just as though they invented it for a political purpose when they when they decided to make it the state religion. They had an obvious political purpose in back of that. Yeah, and in the the ancient Roman Empire, the Caesars were held up as gods to the people, and part of that was worshiping yeah, them. That's and, right. yeah. and some and so people don't understand. What happens that. with um, with Christianity becoming the state religion is that the Caesars were just tired of the rebellions, and so they decided that um, that a better approach would be to make Christianity the state religion, and in that way, uh, the the Pontiff Maximus or the Pope could you know operate as Caesar, but he wouldn't be operating as a secular uh, conquering you know kind of warmonger. He would be operating as a uh, the minister of uh, of Jesus Christ. And but the fact is is that the uh, the title Pontiff Maximus is the title that Caesar held for hundreds of years. Uh, it just means the head of the Roman College of Priests. And the Vatican is located on the very hill that the Flavian Caesars had their palace upon. Um, when Constantine uh, makes it the state religion, and, and he actually didn't make it the state religion, he just began the process of making it the state religion. Constantine just um, uh, started to to use military force to um, to put Christian churches into place and to start shutting down other uh, other churches. But he, he started the process by which, which the Christian church had the military in back of it. Um, well, Constantine gets all this positive legacy for bringing us out of paganism, supposedly. But the fact is that his the edicts that he issued to start Christianity as a state religion were part of a whole collection of edicts. And all of the other edicts were um, designed to bring about what became the feudal system. The feudal system is a system of slavery. Uh, the word serf, and the serf was the primary component of the feudal system. He was the, uh, the peasant that did all the work. The word serf means slave. And Constantine set up all these edicts against uh, free land-owning farmers so that they couldn't own land any longer. They couldn't change vocation. They couldn't leave the land and their children could be sold, right? They were just turned into complete slaves. Now, um, in addition to that, he begins to make Christianity the state religion. And so when you look at the edicts as a collection, then suddenly what Constantine is doing is obvious. Christianity was just put into place as a psychops to prevent rebellion by the serfs, the slaves, because instead of Caesar being the one telling him what to do, it was the Pontiff Maximus. In other words, it was just Caesar with another name. But you wouldn't rebel from this guy because you'd been trained in Christianity and you were told that, well, here's this story of Jesus and this character, Simon, uh, becomes the pope after Jesus is gone. And so we should obey the current pope because he's following in the lineage of Simon and he's Jesus's representative on the planet. And um, I mean, it's a completely ludicrous, uh, you know, propaganda concept. But when you control all the media and the Romans did at this time and you know, they controlled the roads and the ideas and the books and everything. So all you could really do was study Jesus or learn about him. Um, it worked for over a thousand years. Uh, Europe was enslaved uh, and Christianity was the psychological tool that prevented rebellion. What role, excuse me, so Jesus basically said he did not come to bring peace but a sword. Does this explain kind of the nature of the empire of Christianity? Yeah, I mean, it, that's just a little tongue-in-cheek comment on the, what's really in back of, of the, the Jesus character. There's all sorts of mysterious statements that he makes, which uh, people come up with strange explanations for. You know, there's, but, I mean, the, 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 just the, the correct way to understand him is just as a, as a Roman political psychological device, you know, that, that, uh, and you have to just sort of see the character as he existed within the first century, um, when Rome is developing the religion. I mean, 
this character would have been absolutely perfect for the Romans to have come about. I mean, they, Jesus couldn't be better for the Romans if they invented him. You know, uh, he, uh, he is advocating paying taxes. He is advocating, um, uh, you know, um, uh, obeying Caesar and, um, and being pacifistic, not rebelling. And in the context of that statement, um, actually, Jesus is really talking about violence against the Jews who are being uh, um, uh, wicked toward him. And so in the context of the statement of, you know, I come with a sword, I mean, it's actually just a, a way so that people will um, not be upset by Roman uh, violence against the, the rebellious Jews. Where was ancient Judea as far as this empire well to the best yeah, of i mean knowledge. rome was a collection of it was a prison of nations at that point they'd collected you know dozens of ethnicities and little kingdoms and tribes they'd conquered them all and had this kind of rough knit empire that uh, was always having problems with rebellion because the ethnicities didn't like it so but judea was very special because their religion um would not permit graven images uh and in the Roman Empire, you could have any religion you wanted. You could just, they didn't care, worship anybody. But you had to always permit the worship of Caesar. This was the sticking point. Uh, they thought that this was a really important political tool, uh, that Caesar would be seen as a god by the conquered people. And so that was just an empire-wide requirement. Now, the Jews wouldn't accept this. They were the one group that wouldn't. And so they rebelled. And because of the rebellion, um, you know, having this religious background to it, it was very troubling to Rome because at that point, um, you know, there are estimates of the Jewish population of the Roman Empire as high as 15 percent. Most of the estimates are like, you know, eight, nine, 10 percent. But um, it was an enormous fraction of the population. And so Rome simply couldn't sit by and let these rebellions break out, particularly ones as violent as occurred in Judea, because in Judea, the uh, Messianic movement was able to drive the Romans out and to establish its own nation state right in the middle of the Roman Empire at its very height. They actually established their own nation state right in the middle of it. Now, obviously, uh, and, and Josephus, the historian, recorded this, they would have been concerned about the Jews throughout the empire um, beginning rebellions and then this spreading to other individuals. So this was, uh, you know, how serious the situation was uh, in Judea at this time. Judea was really a, a, a very important focal point uh, militarily to, to the Roman Empire. They, they uh, had... The, a very, very long-standing struggle against um, the Messianic movement, and you can see why they went to all the trouble to establish Christianity, that uh, this, this Messianic movement represented a really powerful threat to them, and so um, they had a number of efforts. Christianity wasn't the, the first one. There was a number of efforts that uh, um, uh, the Roman Empire took upon itself to try to um, uh, change Judaism. They were trying to secularize it, to make it uh, less um, uh, intolerant of Roman occupation. Um, none of the prior efforts had worked, and so eventually Christianity got tried. And uh, at the same time, the, the Romans were also um, uh, doing everything they could to uh, slaughter the uh, individuals in the Messianic movement. And so Eventually, the combination of their warfare and uh, uh, the uh, uh, you know new religion uh, took hold, and they were able to um, uh, then have what was known as the diaspora. They actually just removed the Jews physically from Judea, and um, that was really the end of the that era of uh, the struggle. So they, so they were pretty much badasses back then, yeah, the Jews. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, <laughs> the religious. Um, fervor was very powerful and uh, very successful. Um, they were able, they were the only ones that were able actually to drive the Romans out for any period of time and establish a nation state. Um, just as an example, uh, in 
I think it was like 115 approximately, there was another rebellion. Um, and the uh, Jews at that time um, were recorded as having killed every single Gentile on the island of Crete. Um, and it was over, uh, the, the, the historian recorded that there was 250,000 Gentiles that had been slaughtered by the Jews once they were able to get military control over them. So, um, you know, and now beyond all this, the, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Jewish scripture um, has a lot of, uh, uh, you know, genocidal comments concerning the Gentiles. And so the Romans um, saw this literature as, animating them it was what was propelling them to uh to rebel and then to be so ferocious in the warfare um so this was really what kind of was in back i think of the um the christianity project was the uh the wars against the jews there there was uh, the first one started in the year one uh then there was chronic warfare up till 66 when just an absolute full-scale rebellion broke out and they drove Rome out. Um, Rome then regained control of it, but there were still struggles. And in 115, uh, led by the Jews in Alexandria, another rebellion occurred. And in that time, they have um, letters that they found which point out that the Jews actually drove the uh, Roman forces out of Egypt. You can imagine this. This is the breadbasket of Rome. And there's a letter from a Roman magistrate who's trying to escape down the Nile uh, to get away from the uh, the Jews. This was in the rebellion where they evidently uh, slaughtered whole populations of Gentiles. And then you have the Bar Kokhba rebellion, uh, 133. Um, and at that time, again, the Jews drove the Romans out of Judea, set up a nation state, battled the legions to a standstill. It was the, the bloodiest battle that the Rome ever encountered. It was so bad that when um, when the general who actually won finally the victory and uh, defeated the Messianic movement in 135, he beat this Bar Kokhba character. Um, he, the general, when they returned to Rome, you always give a salutation. This was the, uh, the tradition of saying, you know, uh, uh, is Caesar well? And if Caesar is well, I am well and the troops are well. They didn't give the salutation that one time because so many families had lost um, sons in the war that they were afraid that the Roman population would rebel. So they simply didn't give the salutation for fear of the reprisal. So this was how violent and bloody these skirmishes were. And you see, this is the real context of Christianity. This is why um, if you don't have the right sort of historical understanding of the era, you, you just can't get how weird and, and unlikely Christianity was because it's claiming to be this pacifistic religion um, of, from a Jewish Christ that emerges at a time when um, there's a Messianic movement that's waging total war against the Roman Empire. And, uh, the, and, and this is the national movement of, of, the, uh, of the Jews at the time. So, uh, you know, <laughs> no matter how you cut it, it's just the... The religion is just, um, uh, you know, is much more easily understood as a, a psychological operation by Rome than it is as uh, an organic religion that just sprung into existence. And if, if you look at it, it almost looks like they, they went from the Old Testament, which you mentioned the Jews, and then the Gentiles back then. Can you explain it? Would, it, would the Gentiles be just basically anybody of a different race of, of Rome and the Jews looked at them? as a specific people and yeah, race that's, as that's, a chosen people? I think people. that's a, an easy way to understand it from the perspective of the, the dialectic in the war. I mean, who's fighting against who? The, the, the Jews would have seen all of these individuals as um, Kittim or, or um, you know, Gentiles. So they would have seen them the, the, as a group. They would have seen them as, uh, um, you know, a ra racially distinct. But... That was the position of the fundamentalists. The fact is, is that there was an enormous um, inbreeding between the populations, and um, the uh, which which is kind of why when the uh, Roman Caesars would see themselves as the the, the Christ, um, 
it, it, they probably had, you know, some sort of genetic ability to make the claim. I mean, the family of Herod, uh, which was a Greek family originally, uh, just uh, to give you an example, they had been um, trying to breed a Christ. So what they did was is they would take um, brides from the, uh, the, the family that they had overthrown, the Maccabees, and then they would breed them to one of their uh, family members and then train. Then they would produce an offspring. They would train the kid in Rome for 20 years, bring him back to Judea and go, look, here's the legitimate ruler. Uh, he's got all the bloodlines. You see, he's the right character, you know. Um, but that just. So this would be an ancient priesthood yeah, bloodline? Well, I think surely it was. Okay. Yeah, the Maccabees would have, they would okay. have claimed themselves as from Aaron and have been, they would have claimed themselves to have been an ancient uh, bloodline. But by breeding with these women, the Romans would have claimed that, look, we uh, are their, their tax collecting family. The Herod, they say, look, we're, we're the, uh, uh, the correct, um, you know, messianic bloodline. It's not these rebellious people over here. It's us. The, the Rome attempted to confuse the issue as to who was the legitimate uh, bloodline, and they did so, uh, you know, with with some, you know, there was some realism to their claim because they, that family of Herod had actually been uh, breeding with the Maccabees for generations. So, um, and and then beyond this, um, the the other wealthiest family in the world was the Alexanders, who were a, a famous Jewish family. In fact, their family produced Philo Alexander, who was by far the most famous Jewish intellectual of the first century. Um, and this family had completely abandoned the Jewish religion and had aligned themselves with the uh, Flavian Caesars. Um, Tiberius Alexander, who was the head of the family at the time of the war, he actually referred to the Caesars as God. Right, he'd abandoned Judaism to the extent that he was completely comfortable with the uh, Roman imperial cult of worshiping um, a, a Roman Caesar as God. And then during the war, the Flavians made him the primary general against the Jews that were besieged in Jerusalem. So imagine this: the Romans have a a Jew leading their troops, who is from the most famous Jewish intellectual family of the century, right? So you can see that the, you know, the the bloodlines and the theological claims, they're all just enmeshed within the political and military and financial issues. There's no separating them. And so the Romans had plenty of Jewish relatives, um, Titus Flavius, the individual who essentially is um, the son of man that Jesus predicts, his mistress in Rome was Bernice, who was a Maccabean. In other words, she was from the family of Herod, but she was a direct descendant of the Maccabees that had set up um, uh, Eretz Israel with Judas Maccabee in, in um, you know, the, the second century B.C. This was that that was the the uh, purportedly fun, you know. A legitimate messianic family, and yet uh, one of their descendants then is the the wife mistress of, uh, of Titus Flavius. So the um, the Caesars would just as Alexander the Great had done. They would, you know, part of the the colonization process would be to co op the royal families and the religions. That was just routine. Um, behavior of, of the uh, ruler, of the, of the invading ruler. And so they, the, there was a tremendous blurring of bloodlines and religion and things. And Christianity just comes right out of all that. So the Greeks played a big role in this. Well, um, Alexander the Great actually first conquered um, Judea. And um, it was uh, his the descendants of his general Seleucid were in control of Judea and they were trying to Hellenize the region. They brought in what's called the gymnasium where you had Greek um, athletics and uh, intellectual instruction 
the Greek language was spoken. Hebrew and Aramaic were probably very, well, spoken only by very few people. So Greek was uh, essentially, Greece was essentially colonizing Judea and the Jews. And this was what the Maccabees rebelled against. Um, the Maccabees were like in like say 165 uh, uh, BCE, you know, they um, led a group of religious Jews against the Seleucids because this group was wiping out their religion and culture by simply putting in this new culture that um, uh, was absorbing so many Jews. So at that time, the Maccabees uh, fought back. They had a rebellion. They would compulsorily circumcise anyone that they found in their region. Jew or Gentile, if you were, once they would take over an area and occupy it, you had to be circumcised. So you can see that this was a really fundamental group, and um, they rebelled against the, uh, the cultural um, absorption that had begun with Alexander the Great. Um, uh, and in fact, the family of Herod uh, probably had direct uh, family ties into uh, those Greek ruling families that the Maccabees um, had deposed. Um, when um, uh, the Romans attacked the Maccabees, they, they essentially, uh, the family of Herod had gotten themselves placed into Judea as advisors, so-called, and they then exploited a battle or a, a, a rift between two Maccabees. They um, they sided with one against the other, and then when they had defeated the the uh, the Maccabee that was not allied with the Herods, at that point they brought in the Roman army, and that was the end really of um, uh, the is the the Jewish state that had been established by um, by Maccabee and. Um, and so uh, you can see again that there is this, you know, kind of long-standing cultural struggle that has religion as one of its primary components, and that it's uh, the milieu that Christianity emerges from. Yeah, and when you when you look at the story in Caesar's Messiah and, and the way you explain it, Joe, what I see is almost that there was a like a specific tribe or chosen family out of Judea that became part of the Roman Empire that they had chosen, and then they became like kind of the chosen family of the Roman Empire, and then everybody else was kind of like abolished and banished unless they joined with them under the banner of Christianity. And, of course, they yeah. didn't. They would get that's the That's a great explanation. Yeah, that's exactly right. That's, you know, it, it's really kind of, kind of funny because when you, when you put Christianity in such a clear um, description as you've just given you can see how how obvious, you know, it all was that everything really wasn't, you know, some kind of uh, just once in a millennium, you know, bizarre circumstance. It's just this is just the routine political struggle where, you know, you get a family um, essentially uh, from the, you know, that that is a allied and trustworthy on, on a financial basis because it's really money is. If you really want to know what's in back of Christianity, it's money. Um, so the the tax collectors for Rome, the Herods, they were struggling trying to just keep everything um, together, battling against this messianic movement. But what was in back of all of it was just money. They just they were just you know making a fortune um, collecting these taxes and didn't want to give it up, and so. They were perfectly willing to battle the Messianic movement to the death in order to try to preserve the money that uh, they were taking in. In what role did the the Byzantine Empire? They came Before later. Before later, um, Is the um, the families um, that are in back of the Byzantine Empire are, are the Flavians, Constantinople. Um, uh, Constantine's actual name is Flavius Constantine, and they don't have, um, you know, good bloodline records to indicate that he was a member of the Flavian family, but I believe he was. And um, the uh, the his divine arch, which is in Rome, um, uh, is uh, aligned with the uh, the two prior prior Flavians, Titus and, and Vespasian. So 
it's clear he saw himself as having some kind of um, uh, you know, connection to, to the original Flavians who were uh, first century. Um, and he, um, you know, makes it the state religion. Um, you know, in my opinion, he's very familiar with sort of the reasons why Christianity had been developed. Um, at that point, they'd been able to see the religion in operation for uh, more than a century, so they knew it produced a kind of docility uh, in its uh, adherence, and this would have been exactly what they were looking for. They, they were, you know, when Constantine went to establish the feudal system, which was going to be a perpetual and eternal enslavement of the European mind, basically, um, when he went to establish it, he had a long-standing sort of family background in Christianity and um, knew that it was a, a winner in terms of producing, um, you know, a very uh, obedient uh, peasant. So this was what, um, uh, you know, Europe, or the European um, um, individuals, you know, were up against. They were up against a very sophisticated group um, who had been studying uh, mind control, how to control populations for generations. And they were... Um, able to concoct Christianity and finally get it established as, as both the state religion and as a, um, you know, as an effective mind control apparatus so that, um, uh, peasants would stop rebelling. I mean, when you, when you just think of the known and, and not controversial, uh, in any way, um, role that Christianity played in the feudal system, uh, boy, it sure is suspicious. Um, you know, the feudal system was a, a slave system that existed for more uh, than a thousand years. And in every one of those years, um, the uh, ruler of it, the actual hierarchy, was the pope. He was actually the, the highest point in the, within the feudal system. So, you know... As far as I'm concerned, the first principle of trying to understand history is to follow money. And in this case, it's just completely obvious that um, Christianity had been established as part of the controlling apparatus of the feudal system. No, I, I agree, Joe. And when you look at it, when they basically Christianized certain areas, they would you know, kind of domesticate these people. And, and a lot of them were raised as warriors. So I, I believe kind of the old cult culture that they had created before Christianity and, you know, two, you know, 2000 years ago, I'm talking three, 4,000 years ago was basically a warrior from birth to death. And then part of that created a beast across the world. Yeah. And, and then the Roman empire looked to, you know, they were part of course, this culture as well. And I mean, you could look at the Roman empire, then they implemented Christianity as a kind of that mind control method that you talked about. And then when they implemented it in places like England and Britain, what happened is the populations became so passive and peaceful that they were still easy to easily taken over by barbarian nations, such as, you know, the Scandinavians, they called them the yeah. Vikings, or which were non-Christians at the time. So they would come and just annihilate them, which they did um, several times. And again, I know that's not part of uh, Caesar's Messiah, but what are your thoughts, you know, on the, the Vikings and their role in Christianity, because well, yeah, they eventually I mean, joined I, too. I, I have actually kind of wondered the same thing, is that um, the European mind just became uh, enslaved. And when you imagine, you know, 5th century through uh, 11th century um, European peasantry, they were putting up with a system of slavery that was just an absolute monolith. There was nothing else in their existence but Christianity and obedience to the state. And you wonder, you know, there are some rebellions that are recorded, but really very few uh, relative to, you know, the circumstance that they were facing. So, you know, just a natural question is, is how the hell were they able to, you know, the, how, the, the keep these people from uh, rising up at time after time when they had such barbaric uh, or not, barbaric, but they had such demonic control over them. Well, it's as you say, they must have really produced a kind of numb, broken-minded docility in, in, the, uh, in the Christians during this era. And 
that was how they were able to, um, uh, you know, keep the um, uh, this this uh, um, political and, and enslavement system working is that they must have really understood clearly how to control populations with religion. And so when the Vikings show up, it's no surprise huh, that, that the, uh, the populations couldn't defend themselves. I mean, they, uh, they had been completely, uh, their soul, their spirit had been eviscerated by uh, the Roman Empire. So, you know, when we look at our history, um, Europeans, you know, when we look at, the, at our history, we have to wonder to what extent have we sort of lost our way um, uh, emotionally um, because of the uh, the devastating effects of Christianity. Um, it, it certainly was the case, you know, in in the uh, the Middle Ages that we had we had completely succumbed and uh, just couldn't resist. So my question is, well, what are the residues? What what do we have now that uh, we, um, you know, um, are are still under the influence of this uh, of this device. You know, we we think that we're free. You know, we, well, are we really? Um, you know, what what uh, um, you know, it's, what effect has all of this had on us? And what what would really our spirit be like if we had not been enslaved and had not been um, uh, you know subjected to this you know a millennium of of uh, mind control. Yeah, it's it's a kind of a, a double-edged sword there because you look back again. I know you're a big scholar and historian, and I've been studying history too, along with the scriptures. And you you look back at past history, and it was a, a brutal brutal history that we have for thousands and thousands of years. And then here we are, you Joe in beautiful Santa Barbara. I'm down here in Southern California in beautiful Carlsbad, a mile from the beach, and we're talking freely about what we feel and, and from our hearts to people across the world where not too long ago people would have been killed for these words. And I know the, the people that would have brought it on usually. And, and do you think that the same brotherhood, this, the same network, this apparatus is still in control of the world? Well, it's an interesting question. I think that um, the sort of political meaning of Caesar's Messiah is that uh, rulers have techniques for mind control that are far more sophisticated than perhaps we have uh, been led to believe. And so, um, you know, because obviously there's a political context to my work. And so I always, um, when I am asked directly, um, well, what, what would be the advice that would have been worthwhile for, uh, you know, for you, from, from the perspective of your work, to all of these people that were whose lives were destroyed by the feudal system, what would you have said? Is there anything that you could have said that would make a difference? And I always say the same thing. I say, look, you know, what what I would would have suggested as having been useful would have been to do DNA testing on the families that claim to be the ruling class of Christianity, because if you'd done that, what you would have seen is in fact that. They aren't, you know, a kind of random uh, collection of religious individuals. It's just a big family. And if people had seen that, then they would know that this wasn't a religion at all. It was an enslavement device, right? So, so that information, the actual, um, just knowing uh, who the people were related to, would have given a completely clear understanding of the actual reality of, of what had gone on. Now, in that era, they couldn't do those tests. Those tests were just mechanically impossible. The technology hadn't been developed. But they have now. In other words, so given the fact that it is clear that, um, pop, that the ruling populations are using very sophisticated uh, you know, mind control devices, as far back as uh, Christianity, you know, very sophisticated, very, very well thought out mind control devices. Um, citizens would be really well advised to make sure that there, that the claims that the ruling, the people who come forward as rulers make about themselves are true. I mean, are they really um, just a random group of individuals that have uh, 
you know, some different perspectives, you know, and, 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 and therefore end up having wars, you know, from time to time? Um, or is something else going on? And so the only way you could really be sure about that would be to do those tests. To, to, and I think that given that uh, in uh, the, you know, in the, uh, the 20th century, um, I'm trying to think, I mean, I try to get the number and it's different every time I, I look it up, but it's somewhere between, you know, 100 and 220 million people were slaughtered by themselves, right? That they brought about their own deaths um, under the control and orders of, of these political rulers. Given that, I would say that the citizens really are entitled to make absolutely sure that we're not somehow victims of some kind of sophisticated uh, mental techniques that, that the oligarchs have, uh, um, uh, you know, come up with. And, you know, the test that I advocate wouldn't cost a lot of money. Um, it it uh, is very easy to do, it wouldn't take any sort of time. And if I'm wrong, fine. But if I'm right, then the populations would have a completely clear understanding of what our reality is, you see. So so I would I would love to see such tests done. Um, and frankly, the uh, experience that, you know, you can imagine I've had from, with Caesar's Messiah has made me very suspicious. I, I really when I look at uh, political events that are, you know, things that the government gives us that are acts of terror, supposedly, I'm very troubled and suspicious uh, by these things. And I think that the way to get to the bottom of it would be to to do the test that I suggest. And it seems like the, the powers that be are, are doing that themselves on, on the populations with the genome uh -huh. uh, project, Do you know have any knowledge well, on that uh, only that it's it's uh, it's you know th this kind of information is very troubling i mean if you think about um like the nsa and you know they have this explanation as to why they're creating all these listening devices well you know let's just for the sake of argument accept them um the problem is that we know from uh, just historical fact that uh, oftentimes evil people take over the reins of government. This just happens all the time. And if there were evil individuals that were um, controlling this technology, how would the citizens ever be able to get them out of power? Because they could just sit there and listen to every single thing we say. And, of course, with, with big data, they now have uh, these precog capacities where they can study, you know, Google, uh, um, you know, propensities and determine, you know, who would be a likely terrorist, you know. So this kind of technology in the wrong hands is catastrophic. It, it will lead to, uh, you know, massive extermination of uh, population and, and it really ossify slavery and, um, uh, and oligarchic control. And so, because it's so powerful and because it has the potential to last forever, um, it should only be even permitted to exist with just absolutely, uh, you know, ironclad types of control that it couldn't ever get into the wrong hands. But at the moment, I don't see any of that. And so, um, you know, as far as what is occurring at the present time, I don't think I have any better information than anyone else. But the experience that I've had with the, the research in Caesar's Messiah has really made me nervous. And I don't trust government whatsoever. Uh, it, it appears that the temptations of uh, the delight of power are just so overwhelming that they have developed techniques far more sophisticated than I, I could have imagined. And um, I, you know, just flat out uh, do not want to see this kind of uh, technologic power given to groups um, that may never want to give it up. So, um, you know, it's a troubled situation and, um, you know, I, I don't want to try to, um, you know, try to make too paranoid a comment, but I just really am worried about it and don't believe the current, don't, I am skeptical of everything that is being told to us at this point and would hope that um, citizens will be alert to the possibility of um, tyranny, because the uh, um, 
the powers that they have created, um, imagine if Caesar has held those. Uh, there never would have been a renaissance. There never would have been a reformation. Uh, the feudal system would still be going really strong, and, and you wouldn't like your life. In fact, your life wouldn't even exist because, you know, at one point um, the oligarch could look out onto the fields and see the uh, happy vision of all of his slaves producing product for him. Well, that doesn't exist any longer. You know, the robots have more or less uh, taken the place of all of this. Um, you talk about the food banks or the genome projects. I mean, so they can breed for the kinds of populations they want. And they, in my opinion, would look at, uh, you know, the welfare state and just the temptation to say, um, you know, why am I wasting all of my money on these useless individuals, right? In the old days, the serf had a function, but now it, it just doesn't, doesn't exist any longer. And so the serf is really uh, simply a danger to the oligarch because he must sit there and go, you know, what if these people want to rebel at some point? And uh, so that's why I think that... Um, uh, you know, the citizens would be, again, just really well advised to be exceptionally uh, wary right now. And uh, um, paranoia is not a bad thing from time to time. And I would say this is a good moment to to be really, really careful of the kinds of power that uh, are being uh, developed by the by the government, because um, they don't seem to be in good control and would be so powerful that they would lead to a perpetual slave state, uh, and, of course, to massive population reductions once uh, the government was able to get the control that it wanted. It seems like you already see that happening right now, that, that even though I know, Joe, you're, you're saying that this is something you see happening in the future, it's actually happening now, and I, I know you know that. And it's, it's interesting that we are talking on a, a thing that they call the web, and I always say you don't surf surf a web, you get caught in it. Uh -huh. So, you know, <laughs> yeah, and I look at it as a, as a government's, you know, wet dream, you know, the, the truth. It's, it's something that, you know, to be honest with you, I make my living off of it right now. I do a lot of my communications and spend about 10 hours on here. It's the, the best place to gather information. Sure. And I know you, you probably sure. know that, Joe, in, in getting information for your books. So it's just, it's an interesting world that we live in. And, and I agree that people need to look around and see that the pyramids are built, that the, the capstone, I think they're just waiting to put it on top. And all these people that help build the pyramid, there, there's really no, no need for them anymore as they're dancing on the, the deck of the Titanic as it seems like it's going down. Yeah. Um, you know, I would not be telling the truth if I, uh, um, claim to be sort of in opposition to that idea. I, I do see the chance and I think uh, the reality of, uh, uh, you know, population reduction on a large scale that's essentially going on right now, um, you know, hard to know how it will play out. But um, in my opinion, um, you know, I, I just see very little chance that, you um, you know, that, that we, we are, uh, that the oligarchs are not um, sort of organizing their technology for a perpetual slave state. I think it would be um, uh, you know, almost unwise of them to do anything else. And, uh, you know, the, the citizens, uh, those of us that live here in this world, we, we just need to use the Internet while it's available, because it won't be forever, but while it's available – we should be making advantage of it. And uh, the way we do that is by uh, giving information. And you're be to really be to commended on, uh, uh, you know, the information that you bring out, the different ideas, alternative ideas. You know, uh, it's, it's just this is the first time that media is really in the control of the populations. You know, it's always been in the control of the oligarchs from day one till – the internet really came about. And now we are able to essentially create our own understanding of reality. We don't need to sit there and just accept uh, what Fox News tells us. We can actually do our own research, find out our own truths, and then share that information. It isn't just abstract. It's, it's stuff we can actually bring uh, you know, to our friends and to, to the general population. And so 
while we have this opportunity, we should make use of every single second, every single second. And we should create a very uh, more, much more informed and alert citizenry. And so that means we have to, you know, show them the basis for paranoia and show them how to think clearly to um, uh, be able to defend themselves uh, against tyranny. So this is, a, in my opinion, it's a very critical moment. And uh, those of us like yourself who are actually um, helping to, to like create new ideas and new ways of looking at, at things are just doing the, the most important work imaginable. Is there a way to work and meet a, a middle ground with the, the powers that be where, you know, we could, I mean, right now we're distributing the truth and, and the knowledge and so forth. And is there a way that we could be part of this, this society in the future? Or do you, do, what do you see for us as far as the citizenry um, well, of, um, say, here in America? I, I, I think that unless there is a change of a political structure, um, the citizens will be exterminated. That's plain and simple. Yeah, um, there might be, you know, if, if uh, they, they can do it humanely just with um, ways of con making population, you know, uh, uh, or birth control, things like this, they can take a long standing approach to it or they could uh, do it more violently um, because they would be afraid of uh, rebellion or whatever, whatever reason they would have. But, um, you know, if you know if they have as complete a control over government as uh, I suspect, I mean they can just do it any way they damn well want at this point. So, but if you you look at us like say here in America, it looks like a lot of the the things that are placed in our system, it's almost like a free will uh, type of system where people can kind of choose you know, whatever they want at, at free will. And a lot of people are making the wrong choices as far as what they eat, what they put into their bodies and so forth that are kind of uh, speeding this up, you know, the, the cancers and so forth. And I feel a lot of it is, is the food and the smoking. God, and, you just you know, I, I, I always hate to do this because I just go off on, on a rant and it, it starts out, <laughs> particularly since my ideas about Christianity are eccentric, but then when you, you know, get me into the food, I mean, but it's all part of the same analysis. It's, when you see the oligarchic control and how you know clever they are in terms of shaping population and reducing population, you just have to automatically look at uh, things like the um, gender bending uh, uh, hormones that are in clothes and wonder if in fact uh, you know this is actually a, a kind of a very subtle way of, of creating birth control. Um, Certainly, the uh, the sperm counts of Europeans are uh, you know dramatically lower than they were um, you know in 1900. I don't think anyone disputes those numbers. And so, um, what were was there awareness of this as these processes occurred? Boy, I would just be astounded if there was. I would I would I, I would not believe that. I would say no, that's not possible. They they are aware of this, and in fact. Uh, that suggests that they're bringing them about. And, um, you know, one, um, you know, example of this uh, that I've been recently focused on is the uh, counterculture that occurred in the 60s, late 60s. Um, uh, it is, in my opinion, just as clear as a bell that this was a complete government operation that the, uh, LSD uh, and the uh, rock and roll bands and what became known as kind of the archaic revival were all actually um, uh, implemented to essentially dumb down and mentally debase the baby boomers. And uh, I know this just, you know, to someone who isn't familiar with this concept, this seems just almost paranoid or completely paranoid. But uh, the fact is that um, – there is a book called Weaponizing Anthropology by an anthropologist named Dr. David Price, and he, he shows that there are letters uh, written by Gregory Bateson, who was Margaret Mead's husband and a OSS and CIA um, anthropologist, 
that describes, just flat out describes uh, experiments that had been done by the Russian population, by the Russian uh, authorities, um, which uh, determined how best to control inferior populations. And the way that this could be done most simply was by having them embrace the past. Um, so, you know, it's a lot, rather long piece of analysis, but just in general, I mean, Bateson's letter says that, you know, if you want to really enslave someone, you need to take them away from modernization, because if they do that, they're just going to want the technology that the enslaving culture has. So you really want them to get into dance and music. And in the case of the experiments that uh, he, he would, that he was advocating, um, uh, also taking drugs because this, this tribe, the Asiatic tribes in Siberia who were related to the Eskimo had the psilocybin mushroom. And I actually have the Bateson's letter here in front of me. So I'm just going to read it so you can see that uh, I'm not exaggerating. Bateson wrote the most significant experiment which has been conducted in the adjustment of relations between superior and inferior people is the Russian handling of their Asiatic tribes in Siberia. The findings of this experiment uh, support very strongly the conclusion it is important to foster a native revival among the enslaved populations. Okay, now um, Bateson then goes on and develops uh, what's called this MK Ultra program, which basically is studying how to control people and produces LSD. But you have um, a guy named Gordon Wasson, who then is famous for having been the very first person to bring the uh, psychedelic mushroom experience to the American population. This really began the drug culture, when uh, the psychedelic drug culture, when uh, Life magazine did a an article that on the cover described these wonderful you know, visions and, and things that uh, Wasson had. And then years later, it turns out that Wasson had been employed by this same organization, this MKUltra, right? Which then is um, outed in the, uh, I believe it was the early 80s by the Church Commission. And in that time, they admitted that they had given LSD uh, to a number of uh, Americans without their knowing it. These experiments were done primarily in San Francisco, right? Um, and, in, and including in this was the dosing of an entire French village just to, to see what the effect would be. They claimed they were trying to study uh, how the Soviet Union might, you know, attack our populations. But anyway, so now you go forward and you have, uh, you know, Ken Kesey, um, with his bus, you know, with further on all, all these bright colors, giving LSD to children. Um, he worked for MKUltra, right? Kesey worked for MKUltra. The band that he pr promotes is this Grateful Dead band. Um, you know, uh, Robert Hunter, who was their lyricist, he works for MKUltra. Now, the LSD is being made by this guy, Osley Stanley. I don't know if you're old enough to know, remember Purple Osley, but this was the, the you know, uh, the standard LSD dose of that, that began the whole thing. Well, Osley had spent uh, two years at St. Elizabeth's Hospital. He somehow, for some reason, checked himself in for two years, which was where M.K. Holter was doing the experiments on on how LSD and, and, and psych, uh, psilocybin could affect people for mind control. So finally, you know, you, you end up with uh, like Terrence McKenna, who is sort of the, the final kind of guru of the whole thing. And uh, he's describing the whole thing as a, you know, the drug taking and this removing, you know, of, of people from technologic culture as a native revival, right? It's full circle back to Bateson. So when you look at all of these these government uh, links into the counterculture, what what it seems to me is that they wanted to try to begin um, to establish a retrograde population to control, and this could be called neo feudalism, right? Neo feudalism. They they wanted to really start to begin a neo feudalistic state. Now, where I got involved in all this whole thing was. I was very interested in neo-Christianity. See, 
there was a book called A Course in Miracles that uh, these two guys, uh, man and woman, uh, William Thetford and I believe Helen Schumann wrote. Um, and in A Course in Miracles, uh, Schumann claims to be channeling the words of Jesus Christ. And it's a slightly different philosophy than the first uh, uh, you know, information that Jesus is reported to give in the Gospels. So I was really interested in that. I go, gee whiz, neo-Christianity. And then I started investigating uh, Schumann and, and Thetford, and lo and behold, just amazing circumstance, they were employees of MK Ultra when she was supposedly channeling Jesus Christ, and she is uh, at that time a psychometrician uh, working for the CIA project um, to uh, determine, you know, what influences could control groups, right? So when I look at these dots, when I look at these data points, I don't have any confusion at all. It looks to me like the government was um, taking a, a generation into a debased condition. Um, they had had anthropologic experiments giving them a kind of science so that they knew better what they were doing than the Caesars did. Uh, and they even as a capstone had uh, neo-Christianity. So I, I, I wrote an article called uh, Manufacturing the Deadhead with a guy named Jan Irvin, and uh, it's on the web in case anyone wants to read it. But I don't think the conclusions, frankly, can be contested. I think that the counterculture was, in fact, a... Um, a government operation, and it was done with the idea of enslavement. So if you accept that analysis, right, sorry to be long-winded here, but if you accept that analysis, getting back to your points, um, you know, what is the future of the population? Well, I'll tell you, it's not very bright, um, because this means that if you would do something like this, that you don't have any human empathy for a certain class of citizens. As far as you're concerned, give them drugs, kill them, anything you want. They're like animals. So if this is actually the, uh, the mindset that is in control of, uh, you know, these, these elements of government, then we've got a real problem. No, I agree, Joe. I'm actually, I'm an ex-alcoholic uh, and drug addict, and I feel uh, I grew up in the 70s and the 80s, and I was actually the counterculture of punk rock, yeah. which came after that and and I, I definitely did a lot of damage to myself one of the first tattoos i got when i was 13 was live fast die young so that's kind of the the culture of of punk rock not all of it was like that but the majority of of it was that i mean our, our dance was to slam into each other and jump off stages yeah you know i've um you know i've almost been beaten to death at concerts i've uh been in plenty of fights i've broken my nose twice almost broken my neck off a stage so I, I definitely know what you're talking about, but in the in the same uh, breath, there's also the the other side of the coin. There is that I, I chose to do that. Um, I wasn't forced to. It was kind of uh, something I was drawn to. So I, I kind of I, I believe that it's it's not good, you know, that these things are being manufactured and they're in control by the government. Then I also believe it's better than you know, just having a sword and, and we're living in, you know, the, the sixth century and we're living in complete darkness and there's no knowledge or, or gnosis or anything for us, you know, us Gnostics, which I feel like you, Joe, are an independent thinker, um, you know, that we could choose to do. So I, I think we're blessed somewhat to live in this time, even though these are some Absolutely. dark times, I mean, there is some light, we, light in we them have, as well. We um, have a fighting chance because we have active minds. Um, the, the surf, and if you look at our background, right, it was black. And I mean, there was just no intellectual light whatsoever. There were a thousand years of European peasants, our, our ancestors, that didn't have, as far as one can tell, a thought in their mind. They had been put to sleep over generations and generations. So now, as we're having this conversation, these... Uh, uh, insights into the uh, political power above us are things that are absolutely precious because they are lights which can lead to freedom uh, and to a future. So we have to be very careful how we use them. And um, we have to, uh, you know, have the energy of uh, self 
defense and and uh, preservation of life. You know, we we need to bring our full powers to to the problem of how to uh, make sure that we aren't simply slaughtered by by tyrants. Um, so you know, and and I I, I was um, uh, certainly a victim of uh, the counterculture. You know, I took drugs, drugs that should never have been available to me and uh, were attractive because of influences to my mind that, that uh, were evil, uh, that, that uh, were deliberate. Uh, you know, that they were taking advantage of someone who was, uh, you know, uh, a young person who didn't have, uh, you know, a way to escape. I mean, you look at the Beatles, you know, I mean, you know, they start out as so uh, lovable. You know, I want to hold your hand. And then you end up, um, you know, with Sergeant Pepper, with Aleister Crowley on the cover and all of these brilliant colors. But it's all about drugs, drug taking, you see. And so, um, you know, they they change culture incrementally. It's the only way they can do it. It has to be very slow. You don't notice it. If you notice it, then it's too abrupt and it doesn't have as much power. So when they get to the punk movement, They've had a background of a generation of debased um, mu- music, um, debased mu- music stars, pop idols. They've normalized drug use. And so someone of your age coming into that was entering into a culture that was a death machine and had been d- designed to destroy you and weaken you, you know, weaken you and then destroy you. And so. The fact that you got out the other side is to your credit and the, you know, the wisdom that you've experienced, you've, you've gained through the experience now can really be valuable in you helping the younger generation and in informing your own generation about um, what we're facing, what, what uh, the, the, the so-called events we see in the media, um, they actually are. And I, just for a second, wanted to rant about food. I mean, you know, you, you can just, through the wrong foods, uh, poison yourself so badly you can't even think clearly, you know? Um, no, I, I agree. And I think organic food is it's crucial if you could afford yeah, it out there um, to, to yeah. eat it. Yeah, just, just don't eat any, don't take any synthetic oils. If you look in a, on a package of so-called food and the ingredient list is longer than one, just put it away. And of course, you know, things that are artificial like white sugar and all that other stuff just is just insane to eat that stuff. It just is a death sentence. So, you know, you need to have your energy. These are dangerous times. You know, I, I don't really, in my personal world, I don't see the financial crisis as ever ending. I don't think we're ever going to experience a, you know, a really powerful upticking economy because I don't think it's in the oligarchs' interest. I think they know exactly what they're doing and where they're taking us. And impoverishing us makes us obviously easier to control. So that's just one thing to have in mind is you need to have a, a financial perspective of self-defense, you know, of how to manage money, how to, how to retain wealth, what money is, you know. And so, you know, we're, we're kind of um, uh, suffering from the the leftover effects of the feudal system, you know, and and of course with the the modern acceleration, you know, the the uh, the the feudal system had Christianity and you know some kinds of mind control. Well, now they've got rock and roll music, and and just as another example, look at all of the dozens of these survivor type shows that are on TV now. There are literally dozens of them. You know, 20 years ago there were none, but now you turn on the TV set and you see, you know, naked survivors, man, women survivors, dual survivors. uh, uh, And then you have really barbaric uh, concepts like uh, Duck Dynasty, you know, uh, everything is retrograde. It's uh, making old cars shiny again, pawn shops. They're definitely trying to put the ideas of the of a uh, of, of br- embracing the past, a more primitive life in the minds of the population, in my opinion, because it's obvious that they're going to give us that that existence. They, they're putting the mind, the ideas out now with the idea that that will normalize and you'll accept them more easily when the grid goes down, when there is no electricity, you know, when you have to 
make your own fire, you know. Um, so um, the uh, sort of the understanding of history and, and, you know, a really good place to start is coming through the punk movement. I mean, I commend you for making it out the other side of that disaster. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah lucky. Um, that's a really good place to start as to, you know, how to understand what what we're dealing with, you know. And, and you know, just one thing. Don't be depressed. Don't ever think, oh, this is horrible. You know, what a terrible circumstance. Look, the American dream is well named. It is a dream. It's not real. We are always in a food chain. Power is always at in, in being contested. Always. It doesn't matter. It just always does. You have to be alert and you have to develop your own power. And it starts, in our case, with developing community. We are so unorganized against the organization of the oligarchs. So I always, you know, say, look, if any of the ideas we're discussing make any sense to you, if it makes a, if it's a better description of your reality somehow than what you get on Fox News or CNN, then find someone that you can share it with. And then the two of you find somebody else. And then the three of you find a group and then uh, try to organize the group to expand politically. And there's many different ways that political um, energy can, can move and different you know, forms it can take. You don't have to try to immediately you know, have some impact on, on the cr- congressional race. You, know? you just need to develop community. And inside those communities, and, and I've actually been lucky enough to have been led into, you know, some people trying to organize themselves, you can find real um, moral direction, you know, and, and I know that it sounds like, well, it's, uh, you know, it doesn't sound like much fun, but actually you can get a clarity of how to live, you know, when you're with people who you can honestly talk about these things with, when you can obviously share your concerns, and you then can also try to develop brotherhood that will um, enable you to share the financial um, uh, problem. Because if you have slight degrees of organized, um, you know, kind of techniques um, that that relate to financial structures, you can, as a group, make much more progress. Individuals, very hard to get started, hard to get capital, hard to know how to manage capital. You know, the ideas are uh, sometimes, you know, hit and miss. Just try to find groups that can share these ideas and then try to find a way to make a living that is um, uh, not dependent on, the, you know, the vagaries of government, something that you can really control and have some, uh, um, you know, ability to pass on to your children. Yeah, because in this this world, money money is freedom, and especially with with Obamacare coming right. and all those other feudal systems, we we could go on about. I just have a, sure. a couple more questions before you go today, Joe. If you were Caesar, Titus, the bishop of the world, what would you do? The pyramid's built, everything's done, all your work, you see it is is pretty much a done deal, but you have a few billion slaves that you need to take care of and you don't know what to do with. What would you do? Uh, you know, the, um, the Caesars were, dev- they were motivated by glory and legacy. I mean, they had, you know, all the slaves and, well, they had everything, um, but all they really wanted was legacy. That's that's really why they put the crazy typology, which is what I, you know, have discovered in the Gospels. You know, what they they created this weird character, the Son of Man that Jesus is envisioning, and um, you know, they did it so that later on people would know that they were geniuses and had uh, the ability to make this fake Christianity. Um, and so that kind of motivates people, I think, um, a lot when they're young. The, the Caesars actually, you know, early Titus was in his 30s, you know. I'm in my 60s, I'm a parent, and I'm kind of at the point where, um, you know, it, it's really as important to me that um, to share and to have communication as it is to have power. And so uh, just as a, an old guy, I would really try to use, uh, if if power had ever come to me, I would try to use it to um, set up a structure whereby there would be education. Um, Plato's Republic. I would really try to 
make I would I would not want to see an oligarchic um, you know structure go forward into into history. Um, and so to really stop that, you just have to um, uh, promote education. And so uh, there, the, in, mi in the Middle Ages, the um, uh, you know, wealthy families would have their children trained in what was called the trivium and, co and in quadrivium. And basically it was just grammar and logic. And I think if, um, if, uh, if we ever have a world ruler that uh, you know, wants to make sure that his legacy is the clear-mindedness, you know, uh, of the populations in the future. That'll be someone we can really, um, uh, you know, honor dramatically because that would be some, some, something that would could last forever. And um, uh, so that's what I do. I try to I'd set up a, you know, the, uh, the 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 pedagogy that would start children in uh, understanding uh, logic principles and um, grammar, how logic and grammar interact, and I would, I would uh, you know, do it for everyone. That's a great answer. And, and my last uh, question, what, what's next for Joe Atwell? Uh, I'm um, going to be uh, at London um, giving a, a lecture on the 19th um, at the Conway Theatre. Um, it's an all-day event. They're going to show the movie Caesar's Messiah. There'll be a a uh, press conference, and I'll be taking questions. I'm um, giving a lecture, um, and uh, after that, there probably will be another venue in Brighton, but I don't have the details on that yet. But uh, if anyone is interested in in uh, attending it, uh, simply go to Covert Messiah. That's uh, the website that uh, uh, you can find out about the event and also order tickets. Covert Messiah. It's going to be um, in London uh, on the 19th. And then beyond that, um, anyone who's interested in Caesar's Messiah, the movie or the book, uh, just go to caesarsmessiah.com, and uh, there they are. Yeah, definitely. Uh, just and just so you know, listeners out there, you could also get it on Amazon as oh, well. Oh yeah, it's, you it's have available that. just about everywhere. Yeah. Yeah, I was kind of bummed. I, I actually watched it. I, I wish I would have got the DVD, so I'm going to actually buy it so I have that in my, my collection instead of giving three bucks to Amazon yeah, and Joe exactly, just getting yeah. a, a small, a small yeah. little portion of that. But um, again, I commend you on that work, and I, I highly recommend that to the listeners out there who enjoyed this discussion with Joe that they watch Caesar's Messiah, because I did, and it was definitely a great movie, and it's nice to watch something like that there's there's not many movies out there that you could watch the cinematography uh, the way it was put together the, the everything was great yeah, yeah it's so. really great uh, Fritz Heed just did a fantastic job at the film and so it's a lot of fun to watch and it gives people a really a completely different understanding of the general history that we ha we have experienced you know and so it uh, I think it brings uh, the the present time into a, a sharper focus amen and no pun intended <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended but anyways, thanks again for your yeah, time, thank Joe. Thank you very much, and, Bo. Uh, Great questions. I really enjoyed it. And, and just good luck to you, sir. And just I hope I can come back sometime in the future.